Kathy Wong today. Tim has been a friend and a mentor to me in the past during my time at UPMC. He's an assistant professor of medicine there and is the director of their Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Center of Excellence. He's also the associate director of their Cardiac MRI Center um, and has been uh, a great mentor in many aspects uh, and is a, a phenomenal uh, clinician as well as a great researcher combining the uh, all of those aspects into, I think, world-class care. And, um, a, you know, he's really been a role model for me. So I'm really pleased to welcome him here today for Grand Rounds on, a, a, I think, a very pertinent and uh, exciting topic. Thanks for coming, Tim. Thanks for the kind introduction, Patrick. Uh, Gabby and Patrick, can you hear me? Yes, yes the volume is okay. good. All right. I always like to start with a sound check. So, I like to say I think I have the best of both worlds and I get to combine my passion for both advanced imaging and uh, the disease process and really, you know, uh, apply both uh, every single day at work. And so without further ado, I wanted to just give an overview of um, what this update uh, is going to entail in that I really want to take advantage of the recent release of the updated guidelines uh, in November of 2020 and use it as a way to go through uh, a lot of the uh, aspects from start to finish, making the diagnosis, uh, treating the patient, uh, talking about risk stratification, and then also talking briefly about some of the uh, lifestyle issues of living with HCM. And then I'd like to then segue into some of the more um, uh, current topics, including no novel pharmacotherapy, and also revisit an, a, an old but tried and true uh, technique called alcohol septal ablation, um, and then finish up with some summary and then briefly talk about some research, uh, which uh, because this is more of a uh, disease update, um, I'm going to uh, just spend a very little bit of time uh, on that. So I think one of the challenges of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is trying to figure out uh, where, where to start, if you will meaning that if you look at the definition, you often have to rule out a host of very rare but pertinent disease processes that could all lead to the phenotype of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy and ultimately uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, I think the guidelines are now a little bit more explicit in providing uh, a more prescriptive definition where um, greater than 15 millimeters in the absence of any other systemic cause or if there's a compelling family history uh, or genotype than a more modest uh, amount of hypertrophy can occur. Um, I've often asked, uh, I think, key opinion leaders, is there a formula uh, where if you factor in exposure to hypertension or um, diabetes that we can come up with where uh, we can really uh, personalize it for each patient? And I, I think that's one of the holy grails where uh, defining how much hypertrophy is appropriate and how much is inappropriate for a given systemic disease would, would be something that I think would be of uh, great clinical interest. But we're left with these criteria. And um, I think it's always very worth our time to just spend two minutes at the uh, onset to look over, you know, what are some of the phenocopies that we have to worry about when someone shows up in our clinic uh, with the label of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but in reality essentially has left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, this is a table from the guidelines and um, Rather than go through in detail, I'd like to just show you a few cases that uh, we've seen recently. Um, so uh, the top row is uh, three separate cases uh, going from left to right. The first case on the top left shows a patient with some asymmetric septal hypertrophy uh, who's in their uh, mid-60s and comes in with uh, a diagnosis of non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, the e ECG didn't quite um, make sense, and uh, after further diagnostic evaluation, we came up with a diagnosis of transplatary and cardiac amyloidosis. And below is the same patient with his uh, PYP scan showing markedly high uptake of uh, pyrophosphate uh, tracer uh, in the myocardium. Moving on to the next case, this is a uh, middle-aged woman who comes in with nonspecific symptoms of dysmetal exertion was also diagnosed with non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a three-chamber view of the cardiac MRI showing some septal uh, hypertrophy, but uh, also some posterior wall hypertrophy as well also. 
Uh, we typically get an MRI on all of our patients uh, to uh, both characterize the, the heart from a prognostic as well as a diagnostic standpoint. The native T1 map was abnormally low, and then subsequent genetic testing showed a pathogenic variant in alpha galactosidase. So this led to a diagnosis of Fabry disease and not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, this uh, subsequent one, I think the answer is kind of uh, shown uh, at the bottom panel, if you will, but this is yet another patient with some mo very modest LDH, but had no hypertension, no diabetes, and was actually fairly young in his mid-20s. And uh, what you can see here in the bottom panel is that um, in the sagittal view on this MRI, you can actually see a very tight coarctation of the aorta just distal to the takeoff of the uh, left subclavian. So uh, there was LVH, but uh, the, the cause was due to uh, high afterload. Uh, and then just to go over a few more cases that are uh, a bit more on the rare side of the spectrum, uh, we had a patient come in uh, with uh, nonspecific uh, constitutional symptoms. An echo led to an MRI. And then um, what we actually found was this hypertrophy in the basal septum, which is about 1.8 centimeters, was actually due to a myocardial abscess. This black area uh, seen here on the late alone enhancement imaging actually represents necrosis. And uh, the blood cultures ended up growing up out listeria. And then a subsequent MRI, which I'm not showing here just for the sake of time, showed actually complete thinning of the area and then resolution of the uh, abscess after treatment with antibiotics. Um, yet another case of uh, unexplained hypertrophy. This is a hockey player who had an abnormal EKG as part of sports screening and was diagnosed with apical variant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is the cinium uh, still frame in the four chamber view. And then we have a typical pattern of apical fibrosis in the hypertrophic regions of the uh, uh, apex of the heart. However, uh, he was agreeable to undergo uh, routine genetic testing just to look for a specific pathogenic mutation. And lo and behold, we actually found a pathogenic variant in the LAMP2 gene, which is uh, the gene that causes Danon uh, disease. And the reason this is clinically significant is that many young men with Danon disease actually end up requiring transplant and are considered at high risk for sudden cardiac death. And the diagnosis in of itself typically warrants consideration of a, of a uh, defibrillator implantation. Um, and the, the final um, phenocopy I'll end with is um, a middle-aged woman who came in with a loud systolic murmur. It was very subtle um, uh, hypertrophy in the basal septum, but clear-cut outflow obstruction. But what ended up um, happening is that this patient actually got um, imaging in reverse. The MRI ha somehow happened first. And then subsequently, uh, because we saw a lot of turbulence in the outflow tract, a TTE was done, which showed a subaortic membrane. And the uh, Doppler signal on the spectral Doppler was actually fairly early peaking, consistent with a fixed obstruction rather than the dynamic uh, labile upflow, uh, late peaking signal that you would see typically in muscular hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. So I, I really wanted to just briefly go over these cases just to remind all of us that uh, when faced with the patient with LVH, it's kind of our duty to really ask, why is the LVH going on? Is there a systemic cause? Is it HCM? Is it a rare phenocopy of HCM? And to really kind of go through the differential diagnosis in our minds before um, you know, putting pen to paper and, and labeling the patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I, when I get to this slide, I usually breathe a sigh of relief because both of these patients, I can assure you, have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They both have myosin binding protein uh, three um, mutations. Um, and so this is where I really wanted to segue from the diagnostic evaluation to a more you know, management ap approach to, to HCM. And to not belabor standard therapy, but uh, you know, the um, uh, mainstay of initial therapy is to first categorize the patient as whether they demonstrate obstructive physiology or non-obstructive phys physiology. So um, this slide is, uh, showing that the thickness of the septum does not correspond directly to how obstructive a patient may be. This is a young man with an almost three centimeter thick septum, uh, but is fairly non-obstructive even with uh, exercise stress echo. And on the other hand, uh, this patient uh, is only 1.9 centimeters, but actually has a peak outflow gradient of about 100 millimeters mercury uh, without even any provocation. So once we 
categorize the patient as obstructive or non-obstructive, then the um, guideline flowchart, if you will, for uh, therapy becomes you know fairly clear. If there's obstruction, we can treat with first-line medications, including beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. And if those don't work, we can often try disapiramide. And I have an example here of a patient who failed the combination of both metoprolol and diltiazem uh, with severe obstruction of about 68 millimeters mercury with valsala. Here you can kind of see the progression of the gradient as the patient bears down. And then following about a month after initiation of disapiramide therapy, even with Valsava, we have a fairly uh, unimpressive uh, LV outflow uh, velocity of somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3 meters per second, showing a very good efficacy in, in outflow gradient re uh, reduction. Now, I'll discuss more about septal reduction therapy later, um, but uh, moving on to non-obstructive HCM, I think this is one of the uh, key challenges that's um, really uh, understudied and uh, under understood, if you will, um, meaning that we have currently very limited options to treat these patients aside from trying to reduce myocardial oxygen demand and decrease the sensation of angina if they're having it with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, trying to assess the volume status and keep them as euvolumic as possible, and then uh, not forgetting to treat comorbidities. So if they have diabetes, to make sure it's well controlled, sleep apnea, and also not to uh, forget about coronary disease in that many patients, uh, especially once they hit middle age, will often have risk factors for atherosclerosis. And it's important to uh, not forget about alternative etiologies of uh, anginal uh, appearing symptoms. Uh, one observation that we've had over the years is that um, when the patient with LVH presents with, um, with anginal symptoms, and we're trying to rule out coronary disease, um, we found that provocative stress testing is typically a, a, a lower yield uh, exercise, meaning that we've had multiple false positive and false negative results from both stress echo and uh, uh, nuclear perfusion stress testing. And our go-t test nowadays is actually coronary CTA uh, if the, the primary question is to rule out obstructive coronary disease. Um, I don't think this is part of the guidelines, but it's just an anecdote that, um, you know, our, our opinion is that sometimes the massive hypertrophy confounds the perfusion imaging on nuclear and also can, you know, even create um, perceived wall motion abnormalities if the hypertrophy is uh, truly massive. So now that we've kind of gone over diagnosis and very briefly the, the medical management of, of HCM, I'd like to switch gears again and kind of move on to risk stratification. And the sequence of uh, topics is typically what we take any new patient that we bring into our clinic through, where we talk about symptoms, then we talk about uh, therapy, and then uh, we talk about risk stratification. Um, I think the guidelines are becoming you know, more and more prescriptive, and we use both the American and the European guidelines the table here shows the most recent uh, adaptation of uh, the identified risk factors uh, in the US guidelines. And I think some of the take home points here is that this is not a one time uh, assessment, but that typically every one to two years, we should update the information and reobtain history about family history, reobtain history about whether the patient has had syncopal events, and also uh, consider repeat imaging and ambulatory uh, ECG monitoring. Um, some of the uh, changes I'll go over in a little bit, but I think the most major change has been the use of LV apical aneurysm that's seen in a significant minority of HCM patients as a uh, major risk factor for a class two indication for uh, defibrillator. And then kind of a downgrade in terms of how much to weight the non-sustained ventricular tachycardia uh, so that it's taking more of a tiebreaker role, if you will, similar to kind of um, how we use uh, late gadolinium enhancement on CMR. Um, in our lab, we found it difficult to compare our quantification of LGE to other labs. And we've definitely seen a lot of heterogeneity in that we may call a, a patient 12% and then a different lab uh, calls the same patient 25%. And I, I think um, at day's end, uh, I think the clinician most responsible for the patient has to kind of make a judgment call as to does this represent significant LGE or not. 
And um, I, I think some of the more novel techniques uh, moving forward for T1 mapping may help us in this regard in terms of getting a more easily quantifiable and reproducible across the laboratory uh, way to assess the amount of fibrosis there is in, in the myocardium. So I mentioned that we, we often use both the American guidelines and the um, uh, European guidelines. And where I find the European guidelines helpful is that a lot of our patients, when we discuss the concept of risk and discuss the concept of risk versus benefit in terms of uh, uh, making sure that the uh, long-term risks of implanting a defibrillator are outweighed by the uh, potential chance to, to save the patient's life. It's a very abstract concept, and I think oftentimes if we can give the patient a number and say, you know, if it's 5%, then we can say, you know, if we take 20 patients, uh, you have a 1 in 20 chance of having a bad event over the next five years. I think being able to do that um, is helpful from a discussion standpoint and really making sure that the patient is engaged uh, in, in the shared decision making rather than just asking the doc, well, you know, what, what would you want to do? And so some of the different risk factors that the, are included in the European guidelines, including um, left atrial size and uh, LVOT gradient and age. And then the rest of the risk factors are typically um, uh, fairly similar to what's included in the, in the guidelines. LV apical aneurysm, aneurysm is not a um, factor in the current version of the European guidelines, but I think these are constantly being looked at and there may very well be a new iteration uh, uh, from Europe in the next few years. What I don't like about the European guidelines is at the bottom of the table here, where um, depending on what number, uh, what the five-year risk is, uh, the guidelines are fairly prescriptive in terms of giving some concrete recommendations about uh, when is an ICD not indicated and when it should be considered. And I think where shared decision making really, you know, comes uh, to the fore is to really take into account the patient's individual uh, circumstances. I would argue that for the same, let's say, you know, 4.0% risk, a 40-year-old male who was the primary breadwinner for the family may view that risk very differently than an 80-year-old patient uh, who, you know, has a poor quality of life. And then I think uh, being able to factor that in. And I think the American guidelines often give us a little bit more leeway to say, you know, what's reasonable and what's not reasonable, but then also really not worry about, you know, whether are we, you know, following, you know, what, what the guidelines, you know, say, say we ought to do. That's just my own, own opinion. Um, and I, I think at day's end, if you actually look at what the guidelines say, in general, there's a lot of concordance in terms of, you know, how, how patients are actually risk stratified into either a high, higher risk group or a lower risk group. Um, so um, I, I think uh, my apologies for that, we, we had an amber alert. So, um, so now that we've briefly talked about risk stratification, um, I want to kind of complete the uh, discussion for what we, you know, introduce our new patients to and finish up with both genetic counseling and a brief uh, discussion about what the guidelines say about uh, lifestyle and, you know, how to live with HCM. Um, as I had shown in the diagnostic uh, slides, uh, we feel that genetic uh, testing is an integral part of the evaluation, both for the patient and for their families. Um, for the patient, it can identify the very rare phenocopy where uh, uh, treatment might be different from standard sarcomeric HCM. And also for the family, in the event that we are able to identify a causative mutation, we can then easily facilitate cascade mutation. So I just want to bring up the pedigree of one of our larger families just to show you, you know, how effective this can be in that um, we had a proband show up a few years ago who had clear-cut HCM phenotype, told us he came from a large family, but we mainly focused on him and treated his symptoms. He felt better. And then once we started talking about genetic testing, he said, well, you know, my, he's, my family would, would be very interested in, in learning are they at risk or not at risk. So what turned out? to be a simple exercise in providing him with genetic counseling and eventually identifying a MRBC3 uh, uh, pathogenic variant. We then identified that seven out of his 13 siblings had uh, the same genotype, meaning that they were at risk. And then following these seven siblings, there was actually 110 um, in the next generation that we're, we're now actually going to screen by going out to their community. 
and setting up a mobile uh, echo and genetic testing uh, center where we can uh, set up shop for a day or two and uh, rapidly uh, assess uh, who's at risk and who's not at risk. Uh, you may surmise by the you know large family size that this is an Amish uh, you know family and they live about two hours away from Pittsburgh and their fam their single family and um, comprises about two thirds of the town that they live in. And then so I, I think you know this sort of exercise I think just highlights the utility of cascade testing and that um, rather than echo 110 people, we can actually just do saliva swabs on these patients and then uh, figure out who's at risk and who actually needs an echo uh, uh, to be done. I think, I'm not sure how busy your echo lab is, but our echo lab would probably faint if the 110 people showed up on the same day uh, looking for a trans thoracic echo. So I'm gonna conclude the kind of initial uh, portion uh, of this presentation with just uh, some observations about how we counsel patients on how to live with HCM. And I think contrary to what was commonly recommended to patients 20 years ago to sit on the couch and, and don't move, we have emerging data that shows that light to moderate exercise is definitely safe in the HCM population and uh, likely beneficial if we extrapolate data from, from other populations as well also. And I think this sort of observation has now led to a slight loosening of the guidelines where the prior guidelines really were fairly prescriptive and said competitive athletes uh, should not pursue uh, their sport uh, if it were considered you know, uh, consistent with burst exertion types of activity. Whereas now, I think based on this emerging data that you know even moderate forms of exercise don't show tremendous signal in terms of sudden cardiac death risk, I think there's an, an acknowledgement that it's really hard to quantify the exact risk for a particular athlete and that if we can really make sure that everyone's on the same page, the athlete, their family, any sports uh, bodies that they're affiliated with, uh, the, the uh, medical community, then we, we may be able to you know, really participate in shared decision making, have the patient accept some responsibility for taking on risk and perhaps uh, allow them to do something that is a, a major part of their lives. I think one caveat to this is our own observation that from a institutional standpoint, uh, many sports institutions remain uh, risk averse. And one case that comes to mind recently is uh, for those of you that follow Penn State football, a, a star uh, running back is now uh, re medically retired on the, solely on the basis of a uh, diagnosis of, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it appears that he was fairly asymptomatic uh, until the time of the diagnosis. And uh, you know, while all the details of this case are, are not public knowledge, it, it sounds like that um, the, the, the diagnosis in of itself was the major deciding factor in leading to the, the retirement for this athlete. So uh, I think you know, even if the physician feels comfortable uh, stating that you know, a in-depth discussion has occurred uh, from a uh, legal perspective, I, I think some institutions um, may still be, uh, you know, err on, on the side of being risk averse and uh, re redshirt players, you know, for the diagnosis. Um, a few other things that we, you know, like to mention to our patients, especially those uh, who are in the younger range, is that uh, there's been a slow accumulation of data that shows that pregnancy is, um, in general, fairly safe and well tolerated. Uh, there have been some concerns in the past about the use of epidurals in patients, but I think as long as they're hydrated and efforts are made to avoid hypotension, uh, epidurals can be done safely. And so our, our default uh, plan uh, from a birthing perspective is to aim for vaginal delivery. And it's no longer um, probably necessary to you know, really use a cesarean section as a um, uh, first line um, you know, goal, even in you know, moderately sick patients. Um, and then the final thing I just want to uh, end with is to briefly talk about uh, common comorbidities, meaning that even though we see patients as cardiologists and we often focus in on uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as, as the diagnosis, it's really important not to for, forget uh, other common comorbidities that, that may pop up. Uh, hypertension is definitely a very prevalent comorbidity. And also, I just want to mention atrial fibrillation. Uh, which is uh, common, especially if you combine HCM with advancing age. And one thing that I think the guidelines are um, really uh, stressing again uh, with the current iteration is that the chance 2 vast score does not apply in this population, meaning that it does not predict higher risk or lower risk of, of stroke in HCM patients. And because as a population, uh, stroke risk is higher for HCM patients, the, the guidelines therefore recommend that 
uh, you don't risk stratify them based on a CHAD score and just anticoagulate uh, all of them unless there's a, a contraindication to uh, to anticoagulants. Um, so it's been a bit of a whirlwind, um, but I, I think I really wanted to get through this kind of you know overall introduction to diagnosis therapy and and management for HCM patients and kind of cover the entire kind of like initial intake uh, evaluation and counseling that we do with all, all of our new patients. I think this really sets the stage now for us to kind of uh, really uh, go into the meat of some of the more novel topics that have popped up over the past several years, both from a guideline perspective as well as from a science perspective. And the next topic I'd like to go into is to discuss some of the newer pharmacotherapy uh, looking at um, uh, treatments for uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I think the background for some of these newer agents is that, um, you know, the lack of advanced therapy for HCM um, has not been for lack of trying. And I'd say, you know, apart from the disapiramide trials that Mark Sherrod did uh, about 15 years ago, there really hasn't been uh, good trials that have demonstrated efficacy for a whole host of um, medications, many of which are cl currently clinically available. So this slide is just to kind of summarize uh, some of the efforts that have been made to look for uh, alternatives or additional um, uh, therapies in addition to our standard, you know, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, disapiramide, and diuretic uh, first-line uh, therapies for both obstructive and non-obstructive HCM. Um, and I think one of the main themes that has, you know, surfaced again over, over the years is that what works in animals, and especially animal models that have shown LVH regression in response to agents such as ARBs or certain calcium channel blockers may not work in humans, and that's been borne out again and again. So it's actually quite exciting that a new class of agents uh, has emerged, and this is uh, based on work uh, using genetic testing as an inspiration uh, to uh, really you know, target one of the underlying mechanisms of HCM. So the class of drug I'm referring to is what's called myosin inhibitors, which are small molecules that bind to a certain uh, region on myosin and essentially change the conformation so that the actin myosin cross bridges are less um, uh, activated, meaning that by changing the conformation of myosin, you can uh, change the ratio of active to inactive heads. And because HCM is typically a uh, disease of hypercontractility and actually too many myosin actin uh, bonds forming and making the myocardium hypercontractile, decreasing the number of active heads and then decreasing the number of active uh, cross bridges can decrease contractility uh, and then potentially directly treat uh, some of the primary pathophysiology of the disease. I think we can all appreciate from the echo lab, we often see patients with ejection fractions greater than 70% with the myocardium almost touching each other. And I think that sort of phenotype is the a gross picture of what uh, the, uh, this class of drug is, is trying to target. So we now have uh, very promising data for both obstructive and non-obstructive HCM. And the first um, uh, category I'd like to go into would be to discuss the uh, Explorer HCM study, which is a phase three study that looked at the question, can treatment or exposure to Mavicamptin modulate the hypercontractile obstructive phenotype that uh, represents about two-thirds of all HCM patients. So using the Journal Club on mnemonic of uh, PICO, I've kind of summarized the study into uh, a population that uh, was looking at symptomatic adults. You had to be NYHA2 or greater with significant LVOT obstruction, and they were exposed to uh, just over half a year of Maverick Hampton, and uh, placebo was used as the control. The primary endpoint was um, uh, peak EO2 as uh, measured by CPET testing. Uh, so the primary endpoint was defined as either a 1.5 uh, milliliter per kg per minute increase in peak EO2 or um, a three, liter, uh, three ml uh, per kg per minute increase, assuming that the MYHA class was stable. So if you felt better, you only needed a 1.5 increase. But if you felt about the same, then you needed a three uh, uh, ml per kg per minute increase to meet the primary endpoint. So the interventional arm, 37% uh, of patients in that arm met the primary endpoint compared to 17%, uh, and that was quite promising. Uh, and 
anecdotally, I had, I had one patient uh, participate in the study, and she went from being fairly sedentary to vacuuming the house at 10 o'clock at night, which was something that she had never, ever done for the past five years. And, um, you know, that was not an endpoint in the study, but at least from a quality of life standpoint, it was actually quite striking how much, uh, how improved she felt, uh, you know, in response to the drug. The secondary endpoints included uh, the severity of the outflow obstruction. So on average, uh, patients receiving drug dropped their LVOT grading by almost 50 millimeters of mercury. And then those on placebo dropped by, by around 10. And then uh, from a peak EOT standpoint, uh, on average, um, most patients um, uh, receiving Mavicampin improved about 1.5, whereas there was essentially no change for those receiving placebo. This table just kind of summarizes uh, some of these uh, uh, endpoints. What I wanted to just draw our attention to is just, you know, what are some of the side effects that might uh, come about with Mavicampin use? And you can imagine a drug that decreases the hypercontractile state of the heart might drop the EF, and that is indeed true. You can see in uh, panel B here, you can see uh, left ventricular ejection fraction uh, did decline by a few points in the um, Mavicampin arm as compared to placebo. If we look at some of the prelim data leading up to this trial in the phase one and two studies, uh, there were some adverse events where the ejection fraction dropped quite precipitously, uh, typically in response to a higher dose of Mavicampin. And fortunately, this uh, adverse event or this drop in EF reversed after about four weeks of cessation of mineral therapy. So meaning that even if the EF did drop, it seemed to be a reversible uh, drop in uh, systolic function. So uh, I think overall, uh, our conclusion is that this is a positive study, meaning that a significant portion of patients uh, had significant improvement in their obstruction. And from a functional capacity standpoint, uh, had a significant improvement in quality of life and in symptoms and functional capacity. One other interesting take home uh, from this study uh, was just uh, released at the last AHA in November. And this is perhaps a peek at beyond what the drug may do from a uh, hemodynamic standpoint in terms of reducing the LVOT obstruction. Uh, this is perhaps one of the first uh, glimpses of a drug that might modulate uh, the disease progression, meaning that we now have data in a small sub-study, um, I think about 40 patients participated in this, uh, where we can actually show that the LV mass decreases. You can see that LV mass index decreases, the wall thickness decreases um, in response to exposure to Mavicampton. So we can see uh, just cine images of baseline and week 30, baseline and week 30 for both Mavicampton and placebo. And it's a little subtle, but uh, I think the best case is actually in the bottom panel here where you can see fairly profound diffuse um, concentric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You can definitely see that the thickness and the LV cavity size seem to be um, you know, less prominent uh, uh, at uh, the 30 week uh, CMR study. So it's, I think, still preliminary data, and we don't quite know what this means yet uh, in terms of is this a persistent effect uh, due to exposure to the drug, or is it going to be a long-term effect? But uh, in terms of, you know, personally, having looked at, you know, over a thousand, you know, CMR studies, it's very rare to see LVH regression uh, in patients. And the only time we actually really see it is that if we see a patient perhaps uh, the rare patient that en enters the end stage uh, cardiomyopathy of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the EF can drop to 30% uh, percent, and they enter the systolic kind of burnt out HCM phase of, of the disease pro uh, process. I think fortunately this is, a, you know, in looking at the natural history of HCM, it's a very rare event, it occurs less than 5% of the time. So to see this occur in the majority of patients with Mavicampton exposure, I think the, the hope is that this is not actually disease progression, but hopefully disease regression. But I think the data are still too early to make firm conclusions, but it's something definitely worth keeping track of. And uh, I think the follow-up question that I've received from multiple patients is, does this data mean that, you know, every HCM patient should start taking Mavicampton if and when it hits the market? And I'd say that that's uh, still too uh, preliminary of a uh, conclusion to draw from this uh, early data. So we've taken a look at the um, uh, Maverick Hampton obstructive HCM data, and I want to shift gears to some more preliminary data and a phase two trial looking at uh, 
the effect of mavocampine with a more brief exposure to non-obstructive HCM. So again, symptomatic adults with um, non-obstructive HCM were recruited. This time, they actually had to demonstrate an elevated NT per own BNP, meaning that you know there were signs of high filling pressures. They were exposed to 16 weeks of mavocampin uh, controlled against placebo. And the interesting um, findings here is that um, several meaningful cardiac biomarkers of you know, cardiac health and disease uh, demonstrated improvement uh, in response to exposure to mavocampin. So BMP dropped uh, significantly more than um, uh, placebo. And then also troponin, uh, which was often elevated um, but in some patients, but not every single patient, also had a, a significant drop uh, compared to ex uh, exposure to placebo. So the endpoints here were more proof of concept endpoints, meaning that um, in uh, non-obstructive non HCM, what would Mavicampton do to the uh, pathophysiology and due to, due to the hemodynamics of the patient? Clearly, there, there was no obstruction to track or treat. So I think that's why uh, this was a more of a uh, exploratory study where um, we could see, is there even any effect in uh, treating non-obstructive HCM? And um, I think, you know, this is encouraging data, but we're going, we're going to need a more robust uh, phase three trial to really uh, target a clinical endpoint that would uh, merit FDA indication for, for use in this population. Um, but I think overall, I think the community is exceedingly excited in that, as I had mentioned previously, there is not often a good one-size-fits-all therapy to treat the symptomatic non-obstructive HCM patient. And if this therapy uh, would pan out and improve both you know, markers of uh, heart health as well as uh, symptoms, I, I think uh, that would be a um, you know, very uh, wide open market uh, for this uh, drug to uh, f find a niche in treating patients. Uh, this is pure speculation, but you know, whether or not Maverick Hampton might have uh, a role in uh, HEFPEF in general, I think also remains to be seen as well also, and that it, you could argue that uh, non-obstructive HCM is somewhat similar to other phenotypes where uh, there may be uh, impaired relaxation and uh, preserved systolic function. So uh, definitely also worth keeping track of from a uh, applicability standpoint. I had shown some data from the CMR substudy um, uh, in Explorer showing the effect of um, Mavicampton exposure on uh, uh, HCM you know, mass and, and wall thickness. This is one of my uh, non-obstructive patients with apical variant hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who happened to get um, a CMR in 2010, and we typically get CMR, repeat CMRs on a clinical basis every five to 10 years. Got one in 2020, and you can see that uh, the um, thickness of the walls has regressed somewhat, and then also the kind of like very patchy hazy fibrosis that was noted back in 2010 appears to have coalesced into a more dense fibrosis. But his ejection fraction has remained the same. He has not dilated, uh, you know, significantly. Um, you know, uh, to suggest he has a dilated cardiomyopathy. And overall, his clinical symptoms have been uh, very stable. So whether or not this is, you know, a, a marker of exposure to Mavicampton and perhaps some modulation of the disease process, or if it's just a natural history of HCM, I, I think it's um, uh, very difficult to tell the difference. But I think, you know, certainly, I think the role of CMR will become increasingly important in terms of longitudinal studies to track how exposure to therapy uh, and modulates the disease process. So I'll end the discussion with um, Mavicampton and uh, its potential impact on HCM with uh, yet another common question that uh, we've heard, uh, focusing on whether we're going to put cardiac surgery out of business and put interventional cardiology out of business uh, should Mavicampton hit, uh, hit the market uh, following FDA approval. And I think th there's definitely a large unmet need uh, for patients with Mavicampton. Not everyone is uh, really eager for invasive therapy to treat uh, symptoms refractory to first and second line therapy with you know, uh, calcium and beta channel blockers and beta blockers and disapiramide. But on the other hand, I, I think there are some factors that will still you know, uh, uh, create a role for septal reduction therapy. Um, if we look at the Explorer data, about 37% of patients hit the primary endpoint, but that means 
uh, actually the majority of patients did not hit the endpoint and whether they felt improved or enough that they would forego septal reduction therapy is unclear. But uh, I think that's probably the, the most significant point to, to uh, keep track of. Uh, another point is, you know, just from uh, anecdotal discussions with patients, especially patients at the younger end of the spectrum, many of them, even though they're severely obstructive and would potentially benefit from Mavicamptin, are not keen on taking a potentially expensive drug for years and years and years, and also not knowing what the potential long-term side effects of Mavicamptin might be. So I, I predict that, you know, a significant number of patients will still opt for septal reduction therapy of some sort. And if they're at the younger end of the spectrum, they're probably going to opt for uh, septal myectomy surgery. And then the final observation is that many patients uh, who have LEOT obstruction also have mitral valve derangements. And we'll talk more about that uh, later on. But if you have another reason for cardiac surgery, meaning mitral valve repair, aortic valve repair, or coronary artery bypass uh, grafting at the same time, then I think the decision is still going to strongly favor uh, uh, septal myectomy with whatever additional procedure needs to be done at the, at the time of going on pump. So I think uh, at day's end, th there will be a large role for, for advanced medical therapy, but at the same time, I think uh, there will uh, remain some need for uh, actually, you know, um, uh, mechanically reducing the uh, LVOT obstruction by either an ablation or a um, uh, myectomy technique. So I'd like to use that as a segue to kind of discuss how does one make a decision between septal myectomy and alcohol septal ablation, which are the two uh, most tried and true methods for uh, mechanically improving the LVOT obstruction. And just as a quick overview, um, septal myectomy started off as a uh, very focused resection of a trench uh, in the most hypertrophy portion of the septum. Uh, this was termed the Moro procedure, and then it's now become the extended septal myectomy, whereas uh, we realize that the uh, septal uh, SAM contact point may not be actually a, a point, if you will, but have a more lateral extent than fully realized, and also that the uh, extent of the hypertrophy may also uh, travel both uh, down the septum and across the anterior wall. And there is a need to remove uh, portions of the adjacent septum to the initial trench to really create uh, the, the, the most durable result and minimize the, the need for uh, redo myectomy. Uh, so this represents the more invasive, uh, aggressive approach. And on the other hand, we have alcohol septal ablation where a target uh, septal periphery artery is isolated using a balloon, an over-the-wire balloon system, where which isolates the septal periphery from the rest of the coronary system. And after some test injections, alcohol is then infused into the septal periphery, causing uh, a myocardial infarction and necrosis and then uh, subsequent uh, thinning uh, with replacement fibrosis of the affected area. So uh, this is an elegant way to, um, uh, you know, target the hypertrophy area. But, uh, you know, as with anything else in life, there are both pros and cons for this. So let's take a closer look at some of the considerations uh, as to, you know, what might uh, factor in, in the decision making. I think from a surgical standpoint, um, I, I think all options are open, meaning that um, a skilled surgeon can typically fix uh, any sort of derangement, uh, including, you know, a very extensive and hypertrophy septum and also a um, any type of mitral valve derangement, which is kind of summarized in, in this table right here. Um, but I, I think on the um, uh, opposite side of things, one also has to factor in what are some of the comorbidities that the patient uh, carries with them that might make uh, going on pump general anesthesia a higher risk procedure. And these are typically our, our usual markers of frailty or um, complex comorbidity that we see in everyday life. Uh, you know, severe COPD, severe obesity, uh, advanced age, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think the combination of um, institutional experience, patient preference, and also patient comorbidities, and finally, whether additional indications for surgery are present, these are all, you know, the main factors that uh, go into uh, decision-making as to uh, where one might lean uh, in terms of uh, septal reduction therapy. Um, this is just a case example here showing a, uh, about a two centimeter thick septum with systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve leading to very little space in the LV outflow tract. Uh, 
and this is the um, about 10 grams of myocardium that was excised from the basal septum, and all three images uh, are from the same patient here. So once we start having a discussion with the patients uh, about septal myectomy surgery, uh, many of them are not keen with uh, having a sternotomy and are uh, quite apprehensive about what the intraprocedural risks are and also what the um, rehabilitation is following myectomy. And so, you know, I think this sort of discussion uh, directly led to the, uh, you know, creation of the alcohol separation technique several decades ago. Uh, which was initially met with a lot of consternation in that the complication rate was relatively high. There were a non-trivial number of ventricular septal defects, a uh, high rate of pacemaker implantation, and also a high rate of uh, redo procedures. Um, what has evolved over time is that uh, there have been two large registries published, one from North America, one from Europe, that have now really uh, characterized uh, the modern era of alcohol separation in which uh, there's more care given to the choice of septum, meaning that typically we will aim for a 1.5 to 2.5 centimeter thick septum. Below that, the risk of VSD is considered too high. And above that, the heart is considered so massive that not enough uh, myocardium is ablatable to really make a meaningful difference in the LVOT gradient. Um, there's a more, uh, I think, standardized recognition that uh, um, the creation of an infarct in the septum uh, leads to a high, uh, relatively high chance of pacemaker risk. I think most institutions quote about a 10% pacemaker risk. And it's definitely higher if you have baseline uh, interventricular conjunction delay or, or bundle branch uh, or um, uh, heart block, like first or second degree AV block. Um, and then the, one other factor that um, even in the modern age of ablation is that we still counsel patients as a higher risk of needing a redo ablation to touch up the LVOT gradient reduction. So. Um, in general, I think the advantage is that it's less invasive, but uh, the uh, main disadvantages uh, in the modern era are that there's a higher chance of needing a second ablation, and that there's a higher chance of needing a pacemaker, about a 5% chance if you have a myectomy, and about a 10% or so risk if you have an alcohol septal ablation. But I think fortunately, some of the initial concerns about ventricular tachycardia risk uh, arising from inje uh, the injection of uh, SCAR into the myocardium uh, intermediate poor outcomes of VSD and uh, things like that have largely been uh, uh, allayed by these observational data sets that show that intermediate to long-term outcomes uh, following ablation are now fairly similar to that following septal myectomy surgery. So I think from a safety standpoint, the procedure is now mature enough to con consider doing on a relatively routine basis, but the other factors of mitral valve anatomy, need for additional surgery, uh, patient frailty, really need to uh, come into play and be used as the uh, modulating uh, criteria to kind of help the uh, patient make a final decision as to uh, which method to opt for first. This is just a representative uh, alcohol septal ablation case uh, with uh, just a pictorial display of the hemodynamics where you can see that at rest, uh, there's a gradient of about 50 millimeters mercury, and that with uh, provoked PPC, you can see that the gradient uh, extends be well beyond 100 millimeters uh, of gradient mercury. Uh, this is a over the wire balloon system that's inflated, uh, injecting a test dose of a mixture of um, uh, optason and iodinated contrast, so that we can see the result of the test injection both on angiography as well as on 2D echo showing that the target area of hypertrophy septum is uh, appropriately uh, covered by the injection. And then following uh, about uh, two, two milliliters of alcohol injection and a five minute dwell time, we then reassess the hemodynamics and you can see that the rest gradient has now dropped to about uh, five millimeters mercury. And then even with PVC provocation, there's minimal uh, uh, outflow gradient uh, that's provocable. So I think it can be a very satisfying to procedure with um, like almost an immediate feedback that uh, the correct area has been targeted. One point I'll raise is that the final relief of outflow obstruction is actually not assessed by ECHO until about three to five months after the ablation in that it can take weeks to months for the necrosis and then fibrosis and thinning to fully occur. So that um, this immediate um, result or immediate improvement in hemodynamics is actually the result of stunning that's transient, but the actual result of the ablation uh, takes uh, a few months to actually uh, finalize. Uh, 
So um, I, I think we've kind of covered a, a lot of uh, ground here, and I wanted to leave a couple minutes for questions if, if we have time. And uh, so we've talked about kind of, you know, how do we walk a patient through uh, diagnosis, therapy, uh, risk stratification, counseling um, uh, in the first section of this talk. We've talked about a couple of the newer uh, techniques, and one of them is an old, but you know, uh, te older technique, but that's gaining um, uh, improved uh, recognition. And then, so I just wanted to take this time to kind of really highlight a few of the updates in the uh, most current guidelines, just to uh, reiterate um, uh, the importance of them. And you know, I think the whole concept of shared decision making is something that I think is common to medicine as a whole, not just hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but really taking the time to uh, make sure we understand what the patient's goals are rather than being too prescriptive and saying a defibrillator should or should not be placed or sports should or should not be played. But I think trying to meet you know, each patient halfway and really uh, investigate um, you know, why they're in the clinic and what their goals are is uh, really critical to um, really pr providing the most uh, nuanced care and patient-centered care uh, for, for a given patient. I talked about the importance of uh, anticoagulation, uh, if there's no contraindication, for any diagnosis of atrial fibrillation in HCM, and I think that remains uh, highly stressed in the uh, current guidelines. Uh, I briefly co covered the new risk stratification marker of LV apical aneurysm that can be seen in uh, various forms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and uh, typically either echo with contrast or CMR are both good modalities to highlight a uh, bulging dyskinetic uh, apex that uh, is now known to be prognostically adverse and should kind of, you know, uh, flavor our discussion in terms of uh, defibrillators with our patients. Um, and then uh, one topic which I have not discussed yet, but which I thought was worthy of mentioning is the emphasis that HCM is a hyperdynamic state, uh, meaning that a small subset of patients will eventually drop their ejection fractions. And in contrast to our you know, uh, rule of thumb of 35% being um, significantly reduced uh, systolic function, I think in the HCM world, because our patients often live in the 60 to 70% EF range, anything below 50% is considered significant systolic dysfunction, worthy of starting ACE and ARB uh, medical therapy worthy of making sure they're on a beta blocker therapy, discontinuing calcium channel blockade, maybe starting them on spironolactone, and uh, really treating them as if they have an EF of less than 35%. And along those lines, um, you know, a, a defibrillator uh, for primary prevention can be considered in that setting. And especially for younger pa patients, um, sub-Q uh, defibrillators are now being considered more and more compatible with HCM. There have been some early concerns about T wave size and uh, potentially uh, uh, T wave double counting leading to inappropriate shocks. But I think with uh, good mapping uh, and you know checking the vectors uh, before the uh, defibrillators implanted, I think a lot of these concerns have been allayed, and I think uh, they represent a, a reasonable uh, lower infection risk sort of option for for younger patients. So uh, I think with that being said, I just wanted to end with a, a blatant plug for. Um, some of our research interests and maybe extend a handout to see if uh, there's anyone uh, at MedStar who, who would be uh, willing to collaborate on, on some of the, these uh, smaller projects. Uh, I have an interest in pregnancy and um, one of the other hats that I wear uh, that is that I cover our women's and children's hospitals. So I actually attend the, uh, the deliveries of most of my uh, pregnant HCM patients and we've been building up a clinical experience with that. And our observation in looking at this uh, nationwide uh, cohort study is that the, the risk, even though it's considered low, is definitely significantly higher than that of the general population. We did a propensity match score to show that, you know, from a cardiovascular endpoint, there's significantly higher risk of, a, of CV outcomes, although the obstetric risk is, a, is fairly similar to, to healthy. So I think there's a more nuanced um, uh, uh, spin on, you know, the general observation that Overall, you know, HCM uh, patients are uh, fairly safe to uh, pursue pregnancy, pursue vaginal delivery, and uh, I'm definitely keenly interested in exploring that further. And then um, I uh, also have another interest, you know, in uh, based on my CMR background and from hearing, hanging out with uh, Eric Shelver too much in terms of looking at diffuse myocardial fibrosis and seeing, you know, what uh, the 
natural history of this is in a, in a community population of HCM and what it might mean from a prognosis and also a response to therapy standpoint. So uh, I think uh, MedStar is the core lab for a large HCM study. So, um, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to, you know, seeing data from uh, coming out of your lab as well also. So uh, I'm going to end with just a um, kind of a shout out to any of the fellows in the audience. Um, I was a very undifferentiated general cardiology fellow toward the end of my fellowship, but I really, you know, wanted to do an imaging year, get uh, specific training in uh, advanced imaging and CMR. And I think as I, the more I thought about my career path, I was counseled to make a decision. I can either be a modality expert or I can be a disease expert. It's hard to be both, but um, you know, I'll probably find myself gravitating one way or the other. And I really found that you know, HCM was a niche that I think you know, was both professionally interesting and challenging, uh, but at the same time really allowed me to take advantage of uh, some of my uh, imaging uh, skills and interests and things like that. So uh, we are a fairly young center, meaning that we started um, off when I was in fellowship with 75 patients. And when we formally started the center, we had uh, just about 100 patients. And uh, over the past decade, we're now at about 1,300. And I think if you really pay attention to you know, meeting patients where they are doing good imaging, do, providing good patient care, and showing good outcomes, it's definitely a, a very viable way to kind of create a niche for yourself that kind of straddles the both the imaging and the, uh, you know, d disease uh, entity. And at least for myself, it's been, I, I think, um, one of the most gratifying ways to uh, kind of uh, straddle, uh, uh, be at the intersection of uh, uh, two uh, niches uh, within cardiology. So I'm going to end there and just say thank you to uh, all the folks that uh, have helped make this possible. And I really want to thank Gabby and um, Drew and uh, Patrick for inviting me to just uh, spend uh, 45 minutes uh, uh, with the group at MedStar and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Jim. That was a nice overview. And um, I know we're at time, but uh, I'll open up the floor to questions. So Steve, I see you there. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, based on some epidemiologic data from Professor Gour, who coined the term sigmoid septum, Framingham, and several other studies. Um, I, I had always felt that a sigmoid septum, uh, which clusters in patients over the age of 60, 70 years old in, in all of those studies, represents an aspect of aging rather than being uh, some form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But more recently, there are some genetic studies that suggest that some of these elderly patients with sigmoid septum uh, may actually have HCM genetically. So uh, I just want to hear your opinion on that and how, how can we differentiate if we see a sigmoid septum with or without obstruction in an elderly patient, uh, how do we determine if this is um, uh, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or just some uh, aging phenomenon? So I think my favorite review article on this topic is by Canepa, C-A-N-E-P-A, -E and I'm happy to email it to anyone interested, uh, which comes out of Ted Abraham's group. He was at Hopkins and is now leading HCM at UCSF. His approach is that he lists a variety of factors that for the average, he calls it ventricular septal bulge. But, uh, you know, my interpretation is that, you know, uh, uh, sigmoid septum and ventricular septal bulge are, are, are you know, uh, the same entity being spoken of. If there's a family history of HCM or if there's LVOT obstruction, his anecdotal data suggests that the chances of HCM are, are higher. Whereas if there's zero obstruction, zero family history, and also what we commonly consider cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, um, uh, diabetes, that would favor the you know, natural aging process, if you will. So I think uh, what I've just mentioned is taken directly from his review article, which I, I, I often cite. And the, the final thing is that, um, you know, I think it's even with those criteria in place, it's imperfect. And our practice has been, you know, to offer genetic testing to any patient that is interested in it, meaning that we often get patients who are 70 years old, have a 1.5 centimeter septum, it's asymmetric, uh, 
there's mild LVOT obstruction. And some of our patients, you know, just want to be told, you know, you know, you're, you're relatively asymptomatic, there's no obstruction, how about we just monitor you? We don't know if you really have it, but we, we kind of think it's just due to age. Uh, whereas other patients are, are, you know, fairly concerned, and then we'll, uh, we feel comfortable throwing the book at them. And I can tell you about 5% of the time, uh, we find a pathogenic HCM mutation um, that then really reclassifies them from just an innocent sigmoid septum to sarcomeric HCM. And then we take advantage of that data and we can do cascade testing on the rest of the family, and it's really a game changer. So I think uh, we try to keep an open mind to any you know, sigmoid septum, uh, characterize it as best as we can in terms of family history, symptoms, and also the, the degree of LVOT obstruction. We almost always MRI them to see if there's any uh, forms of infiltrative cardiomyopathy, including amyloid, uh, and there's a several percent uh, you know, incidence of amyloid that we find in that population also. And, you know, there's, definitely some referral bias, but I think that's my three minute answer to a very complex question, but um, I'm happy to email that article to uh, uh, Pat and uh, Gabby and, you know, they, they could forward it to, um, to, to anyone else. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Gabby, do you have time for me to ask a question? Go ahead, Bill. All right. Thank you. So Tim, that was a great talk. I learned, I learned a ton from it. Um, a couple of, of comments. First of all, I think it's useful to think about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as a syndrome rather than, than a uh, disease. There are multiple genetic abnormalities, uh, sarcomeric ab genetic abnormalities that cause the, the, the phenotype of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, not one or two, but multiple. Also in the registries, only about 40% of the, the patients have an identifiable uh, abnormality. So I think we can think about this as multi multiple diseases with overlapping phenotypes. The sarcomeric abnormalities in our, uh, in our registry is associated in particular with one phenotypic abnormality though, though and that's re uh, reverse septal uh, curvature. The other point I wanna make is about prediction modeling. Prediction modeling and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as in many other situations is pretty weak. Uh, and actually, the reason that, that we, along with Chris Kramer, the RPI, got, got the grant in the first place uh, was to improve prediction modeling. I've always been skeptical about our ability to do so, um, and we'll see. We're not, we're not there yet. What we do have, uh, and, and we hope it's going to be accepted for publication quite shortly, is a prediction model for atrial fibrillation. Um, but even there, it's, it's, only, it's only modest with an area under the curve, uh, CNX, of about 0.75. So our, our prediction modeling is, is, is not all that great uh, and we've got to get better at it, at, at, at it yet. Um, I also think that, you know, there's not been a lot of uh, randomized trials. There's now seeing pharmacotherapy with randomized trials and this disease is very exciting. Anyway, comments, Tim. Yeah, so I think the, um, regarding the definition of HCM, it's, you know, I think very confusing. So if you look at the pediatric literature, any LVH in a kid is termed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, irrespective of whether there's any systemic or genetic etiology. So Newman syndrome is typically called HCM. Whereas in the adult literature, if you, you know, follow the guidelines strictly, Barry Marin says you should call LV, you know, call a heart with Newman's LVH due to Newman syndrome and not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then to make the adult literature even more uh, confusing, if you look at the European guidelines, they kind of seem to favor how the pediatricians call it, meaning that anyone with a thick heart that's not due to hypertension or aortic stenosis is also termed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I, I think, you know, it's really very much a, a matter of definition. And I think the whole focus on the soccer mirror has been more, uh, you know, based on, you know, trying to categorize patients and put them into a single bucket so that, you know, for the sake of research, they can be studied more easily. And I, I think, you know, one interesting um, observation just from talking with some of the myocardia folks is that Mavicamptin works to reduce LVOT obstruction, whether or not you have a myosin mutation or not. But if you don't have a myosin mutation, sometimes it's, they, they think that you need a higher dose of Mavicamptin to, uh, you know, effect that, you know, drop in, in LVOT gradient. And then so, you know, I, I think that observation in my mind kind of leads back to your comment about, you know, uh, this being a, a syndrome and a phenotype rather than, you know, just purely a, a sarcomeric mutation. But I think the, the, the fact that Mavicampton may work, you know, even if you don't have the correct mutation, 
uh, is definitely, you know, uh, something of interest and, you know, really, you know, if it can transcend the ge genetic etiology line, then I, I, I think, you know, the observation that we should think of it more as a syndrome than as a sarcomeric disease is, is very well taken. Um, and then the, uh, you know, I, I think the genetic yield is, uh, you know, definitely something um, of uh, a lot of interest. The, um, what we tell our patients is that if they have a negative genetic test is that they still have HCM and that we can see that they have, they have a thick heart, but that, you know, science hasn't identified the mutation. There may be non-coding regions of DNA now that, you know, can impact the phenotype. And that's something that, you know, I think several folks are studying right now. And, uh, you know, I definitely think that there's more to it than just a simple Mendelian, um, you know, uh, you know, loss of function mutations and things like that. And the Amish population that I, sh I showed you has probably around close to 300 affected HCM members, of which I probably care for about 50 right now. If you look at this range of phenotypes, they all have the same, you know, uh, Amish MYBPC3 mutation, but the phenotypic variation is extraordinary. Non-obstructive, obstructive, you know, severe symptoms, you know, minimal symptoms. And I think some of these uh, modulating genetic factors that may not be coding for anything, but, you know, maybe on the either the transcription portion or, you know, DNA folding portion of things, I, I think the, there's a big story that it, it, is yet to be uncovered uh, along those lines. So those are just two, uh, you know, very quick thoughts. Thanks. Uh, Ron, if you're trying to ask, you're muted. Uh, Ron Waxman, I, I'm an interventional cardiologist and we recently had a series of cases that we have patients with HCM and severe aortic stenosis. You mentioned subaortic membrane, but I'm calling for those patients that are undergoing TAVR. And one of the consideration, you don't know who of those would develop uh, suicide ventricle, who would those require first therapy for the HCM, and then the aortic stenosis. Most of those aortic stenosis are severe. So I wonder if you have any experience with these and what would you recommend us to do first? Should we treat them prophylactically with some medications to go through the TAVR safely? Should we do um, septal reduction with alcohol ablation? These are patients that usually opt not to have surgery. Obviously, they can have aortic valve replacement and myomectomy. Uh, and, and we had the, more than one in the most recent one was more dramatic, but we have those who are borderline that you cannot predict what's going to happen with those patients when you're having the TAVR. Any insight and suggestions how to treat those patients? So I think while rare, it's not, not trivial. And so I think we, we have a meeting uh, maybe once a quarter to discuss cases like that. And what we try to do is try to figure out is the AS worse or is the um, you know, uh, muscular gradient, the LVOT gradient worse? Uh, sometimes by a slow pullback, sometimes by, you know, uh, combined with visual review of the uh, uh, echo imaging, both uh, TTE and TE, it, it, it's very hard to figure out. One thing that we've started doing is that if we think that the LVOT muscular subaortic gradient is a significant contributor, we'll actually start disapyramide uh, on the patient uh, at a low dose to see if by treating that, whether it can be more clear as to how bad the AS is meaning that if we reduce the LVOT gradient and the AF is you know, still you know, severe, we'll um, keep the patient on disapyramide, treat the AS, and then subsequently you know, maybe do uh, uh, an alcohol ablation uh, thereafter. So I think so, you know, the disapyramide can be a fairly potent, assuming that the EF is normal, um, it can be a fairly potent way to try to figure out, you know, what's the relative contribution of the LVUT gradient and perhaps buy you some time so that you can fix the AS first and then uh, go after that. On the other hand, um, you know, uh, there are some people that advocate, um, you know, prophylactically creating space in the LVOT via alcohol septal ablation so that you can then, then do the TAVR. So I think it really boils down to, um, you know, Slow, slow catheter pullback, trying to make your best guess. And, you know, I would argue that if anyone says that they know what's going on, it, it's a very mur murky field when you have two uh, 
resistors in series and you're trying to figure out which resistance is worse, it's quite difficult. But, you know, we've used disapyramide a few times to try to, you know, treat one because in theory the disapyramide should not affect the AS at all to kind of get a better sense of how, how much trouble is the LUT uh, ca uh, causing. Um, so that, that's our... Uh, uh, or, or brief take, but you know, I, I'm happy. You know, uh, happy to take a look at images anytime if you want to send a CD over or things like that. Thank you. Any other questions from the group? Um, if not, uh, thanks so much, Tim, for really that very nice overview of both sort of the basics of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but also. Uh, of exciting new directions where we're going and, and a lot still to learn uh, on this disease. And now that we have larger databases and larger registries, uh, and hopefully there'll be a lot more data coming. Um, <clears throat> and with that, we'll uh, close for today and we'll see everybody uh, next week. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Tim.